thanks for coming. So, uh, as Ben mentioned, I've got two books out so far. Uh, more on the way, of course, as all academics always say. Uh, and I'm going to focus on research related to the first one today, which is on my uh, mobilization research on increasing um, voter turnout, particularly in the Latino community. So this story begins in 2000. Um, in 2000, Alan Gerber and Don Green launched the subfield of field, randomized field experiments in voter mobilization with this piece in the American Political Science Review. And Don Green was my advisor at Yale. In fact, I have the distinction of being Don's first PhD to finish the program. So we're bonded together for life. And uh, while it had been some years since I finished my graduate work, I was in Chicago for the Midwest, walking down the street. There's Don Green. He says, hey, I've got this cool new stuff coming out on voter mobilization. You should really try it with Latinos. And I said, sure, I'll do that. Um, and so I've been doing this sort of research since 2001, thanks to a little shove from, from Don Green. And the idea of these experiments is that if you really want to know what makes people vote, you should replicate kind of what they do with medical drug trials. Take a pool of potential voters, divide them into treatment and control, treat some of them either by telling them to vote or exposing them to some kind of information, and don't treat the other ones. Either do nothing to them or maybe treat them with a placebo, tell them to recycle, or uh, remind them about daylight savings time. Those two things are, are uh, often used as the placebos. And then after the election, if you go and look at who voted and whether the rate of turnout is higher in the treatment group than in the control group, you know, because it's a randomized experiment, that whatever treatment it is that you applied is responsible for the change in voter turnout. So Alan and Don did the first experiment. Like many Yale professors, they experimented with the people of New Haven, Connecticut. But other people followed in their footsteps and started doing it in other communities. And so five years later, after a few hundred experiments, we had figured some stuff out. You know, we, political science scholars, had figured some stuff out. That if you engaged in door-to-door -door canvassing, if you go to somebody's house and say, uh, Ben, I'm just here to remind you that the election is next Tuesday. Can I count on you to vote? And he said yes. Then his likelihood of turning out would be 7 to 12 percentage points higher. If I just called someone on the phone and said, Eric, just calling to remind you that election day is Tuesday. Can I count you to vote? That would also increase turnout, but by a smaller amount. And other stuff didn't seem to work, leaving door hangers on people's doorknobs, leaflets, indirect methods, as we uh, usually call them, didn't seem to work, that it seemed to need that personal connection. So that's kind of where we were after five years. But the truth is most of the experiments, especially most of the large, robust experiments, had been done with majority white populations. And we didn't really know very much about how this worked in ethno-racial communities. A couple of people had done experiments with black populations. Uh, Don Green did one with the NAACP. That was a combination telephone um, and mail experiment. And that failed. In part because the NAACP didn't follow instructions. This is actually often, this is a common problem with uh, field experiments that work with a community organization. They didn't want to not treat the control group. They wanted to talk to everybody because they wanted everybody to vote. But that ruins the experiment. And so then you don't really know if the treatment is effective or not if you've treated both the control and the treatment groups. So he was a little upset about that. Um, Don and I had more success with ACORN, although of course you all know that ACORN has not been so successful and has, was killed soon after we did our work with them, but we worked with them in a few cities uh, go, going door to door with ACORN canvassers and telling people that they should vote because of something local in their community. Uh, you need to vote to keep the local bus line open, you need to vote to get a living minimum wage, and those campaigns were very successful. We also knew a little bit about getting out the Asian American vote. Um, Janelle Wong worked with the Asian Pacific, Asian Pacific American Legal Center in LA to do phone calls. 
Uh, that effort didn't work, but it solved a lot of the logistical difficulties. Yes, yeah, sorry. Is that Trivedi the one who ran for governor some uh, years ago? No, that's just a grad student from Yale. Not so not from Yale. No. Okay, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so, so Janelle's Wong experiment with the Asian Pacific American Legal Center didn't work to increase turnout, but it helped solve the problem of how to reach out to Asian American voters. There's a lot of Asian languages, right? And so if you're doing turnout with white or Latino or African American populations, English and Spanish, you're good to go. And you can hire bilingual canvassers or volunteers. Asian American populations, that's a little bit harder because then you've got Chinese, right? Mandarin, Cantonese, Vietnamese, Korean, Tagalog. It's very complicated. Um, but Janelle figured out that you could divide by surname. You could come up with a pretty good guess for which uh, national origin group somebody mm -hmm. fell into. Um, so that later allowed for work that was more successful. And um, Wang and Trivedi have also tried direct mail with Asian American voters, and again, that would, could be targeted by language, but neither of those worked. So actually, looking back at the time, five years into all these experiments, nothing on Asian Americans had worked to get out the vote. And then on Latinos, there was a little bit there were the ACORN experiments that I mentioned earlier, and some of those had been successful. The ones with Latinos, we were talking about keeping a local hospital open, or, um, well, I don't remember what the other one was, but again, local issues to make sure that uh, people knew how important it was to vote. And then I had done some independent ones because of that sidewalk conversation with Don Green back in 2000, where I took students from Cal State and we descended on local cities and we went door to door and we increased the vote. It's actually pretty fun. The first one we did was for a school board election in Dos Palos, California. Dos Palos is a tiny little farming town in the middle of California, in the middle of nowhere. Um, so not surprisingly, when 40 Mexican American students suddenly showed up and then we're having like a pre-canvassing meeting at the gas station, a law enforcement officer came by. He's like, I ran your plates. You guys are from out of town. I'm like, we're just here to get out the vote, we're really not doing anything bad. So uh, so we were noticed, but we were also very successful. It was super cute. We'd go to, um, I was canvassing too, I was in disguise as a student, um, and I'd go to someone's house and ask, you know, is uh, Joe here? I'm here to, um, I have a message from, can you tell me no? I really have to talk to Joe. And she'd like, okay, well, he's out and back, come on, get in the truck. And we'd go driving around the fields looking for Joe so that I could personally deliver my voter mobilization message. People are super nice. Um, when we couldn't find somebody at home, sometimes a student would just kind of hang out across the street for a while, waiting for them to come home from work. And then they'd see the car go in, and then they'd wait a minute so it wasn't too creepy. And then they'd go ring the doorbell. Um, we also had some more exciting adventures of, you know, people answering the door with no clothes on or uh, this one guy came to the door and these two young women are standing there and th before they even had a chance to say anything he said is this about the baby oh this is about the election so hopefully he liked that answer and didn't want it to be about the baby um, do so naked people vote at higher levels then? don't know <laughs> that was just reported to me later uh, but we did increase the vote it was very successful even though it was a low salient school board election, the sleepy election where everyone knew who was going to win, it wasn't like there was a Latino candidate. It was just a very uh, basic get out the vote campaign, but it worked. Um, and I had done a couple more in, uh, in Fresno as well. And so we knew in 2005 that door to door worked to get out the vote. Ricardo Ramirez had worked with Naleo to do some phone and mail experiments. And as of 2005, those had not worked. And so as far as we knew, the only way to get Latinos to vote was door to door. Nothing worked for Asian Americans. African Americans, we had some evidence from door to door, uh, but not very much. We really didn't know very much. And so in December of 2005, the James Irvine Foundation decided to launch the California Votes Initiative. And this was only in California. They were concerned about the disparities that persist even today between the population and the electorate. That the electorate is much more white than the population. And so policymakers, elected officials, 
logically are more likely to cater to the needs and policy preferences of the white electorate than they are to the population. And so given that the James Irvine Foundation is interested in equity and everyone being represented, they thought, well, if we can get these low propensity com ethnic communities out to vote, share the information about how to do it with a bunch of other groups besides ours so that everyone's doing it, we'll change the electorate, we'll get the attention of policymakers, and we'll make California better, and who knows how far this will spread. Um, so they sent out a request for proposals for academics to evaluate it, and they foolishly picked me to be the PI of their evaluation campaign. Then we sent out a request for proposals to community organizations to work with us, and uh, my team and I worked with the James Irvine Foundation to pick the 10 groups that would get the funding, and a requirement of the funding was that they had to cooperate and let me randomize their get out the vote campaigns so that I could figure out best practices and what worked. We had a specific emphasis on infrequent voters in low-income and ethnic communities. Originally, this was going to mostly be the Central Valley. We extended it to Southern California um, and Orange County to make sure we hit Asian American populations. Uh, but pretty much the Central Valley, so all the way up from Yolo County, Sacramento Valley, all the way through the um, San Joaquin Valley, down through Bakersfield, into Riverside County, San Bernardino County. So that whole middle part of California, where these communities live. We had 10 organizations that worked with us, and as you can see, half of them were organizations that focused on Latino populations. Uh, so the first one is a pseudonym, but that was a group targeting African Americans. So the pseudonym we use in the book is African American Communities United, I think. Then uh, that same group that Janelle Wong worked with, the Asian Pacific American Legal Center, uh, CalPERC, and then Okakaka is the Orange County Asian Pacific Ameri Asian Pacific Islander Community Organization, Community Association. The other five were groups that targeted Latinos some of which are pretty well-known major groups. So it was a very promising group of, of organizations. Caresen, which deals <coughs> with Central American refugees in Los Angeles. CCAJ, which is an environmental justice organization in uh, Riverside County. Naleo, of course, uh, National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials. Uh, Pico National Network, which is a congregation-based organization, so this serves multi-ethnic, multi-racial communities, but many of them were Latino communities. Southwest Voter Registration Education Project, which uh, is headquartered in LA, but works all over the country. And then SCOPE, which is in South Los Angeles. And South Los Angeles is the rebranded South Central, but we dropped the Central so that people would maybe be tricked into thinking this was a new part of Los Angeles and not as dangerous and horrible. It's also uh, been changed over time by waves of Latinos moving to that part of Los Angeles. So now instead of being a very heavily African American community, now it's very mixed Asian, uh, sorry, African American and Latino. So uh, most of the findings I'm going to tell you about are from the five that are highlighted because those are the ones targeting Latino voters in particular, but of course the book covers all of those groups. And all of these were unlikely voters. Everybody who <coughs> targeted in these campaigns were folks who most campaigns don't bother with. Right? Why would you go campaign in a community of non-voters? When I was in Fresno, I once spoke to a woman who was going to run for school board. And she was running particularly to represent Latino families. And she told me that her campaign manager told her that she should campaign in the white Republican suburbs of Fresno, not the Latino part of of Fresno because Latinos don't vote. So she needed to win. In order to win, she should go reach out to, to women in the suburbs and run as a woman. But then once she was elected, then she could go ahead and represent the Latino community. But don't waste your time trying to get them to vote for you because Latinos don't vote. So that was the first thing we were trying to prove is that no, actually, if you would bother to ask them, they would, right? Um, and so we were trying to prove that if you reached out to these unlikely voters, they would in fact respond just like likely voters. Yeah. Were these people registered to vote already? Right, yes, they're already, already registered. registered to vote. Right, but they hadn't been voting, right? So they were registered, but were sitting out elections. So 
Um, that's a good question. So one of the rules under, uh, one of the federal rules that we were restricted by was we could not engage in registration because under the Voting Rights Act, if you engage in voter registration of this kind, you'd have to do it in at least five states. And the James Irvine Foundation in this project was only interested in California. So the money that was given to these organizations could not be spent on registration. And we only could work on mobilizing people who are already registered to vote. So we were mobilizing people who for some reason, maybe because of motor voter or some other reason, had registered to vote at some point, but weren't participating. Um, and there were reasons to think that this wouldn't work, right? Uh, after all, we weren't giving them more resources and most basic political science theories and texts, right? All these very famous books like The American Voter, um, or uh, Verba Schlossman and Brady's work says, well, voting's all about resources. So we weren't making people wealthier, we weren't making people older, we weren't giving people more education. We were just dropping by and having like maybe a five minute conversation on their doorstep, maybe a two minute conversation on, on the phone um, and asking people to vote. So we weren't giving them more resources. Uh, we weren't giving their community more social capital. Nothing was really changing in terms of these uh, classic studies of what makes people vote. And yet, time after time, it worked. We conducted close to 300 experiments for this book over five election cycles. So the call for proposals went out to the community groups in December 2005. Our first election that we worked on was June of 2006. And then we did another round in November 2006. And then in 2008, we did three because, of course, we had the split primary in California, February, June, and then November 2008. And since I'm in Wisconsin, maybe I'll just remind you why we had two primaries in 2008 in California. It was, of course, a presidential election year, and so we had to vote for who was our preference for president. And we wanted our votes in California to count because usually by the time California has its primary in June, the presidential nominee is pretty much already set and we feel really hurt that we didn't get a chance to have our voice heard. And so that year they had voted to move it to February. So Obama and Hillary and the other candidates were on the ballot in February. But at the same time, members of the California state legislature wanted their term limits extended and so if they could get California voters to approve an extension of term limits in February, then they could run again in June without losing their jobs. So they forced the state to have two primary elections and cost the state $60 million, and we rejected the term limits extension so there, and they all lost their jobs anyway. But that was good for us because it meant we had two primaries with which to work, and then the November uh, 2008 election. So, uh, we conducted o about 300 experiments. Uh, we collected a lot of data. Um, we got some really interesting findings in 2006, and I'll start to show you some of the findings in a minute, but we also had some real mysteries in terms of campaigns that looked exactly the same weren't resulting in the same impacts on turnout. And so in 2008, we embedded observers with all of the organizations where either somebody was sitting in the room during the phone bank and listening or walking with the canvassers going door to door. We had them go to the training sessions for the canvassers. Um, so we collected all sorts of qualitative information as well. We hired about two dozen grad students and undergraduate students in 2008. Uh, they collected about 3,000 hours worth of observations. And that really helped us flesh out some of the more qualitative stuff about what works to get out the vote and what doesn't. So first of all, it worked. One of our first experiments uh, in June 2006 when it was an amazing success. Um, I should warn you that none of the other ones are this big like this. In a way, this was awesome because it was the first round and it kind of got everybody excited. Uh, but on the other hand, it was also frustrating because we never hit this kind of numbers again. 
So uh, in case you've lost track of all the acronyms, CCAHA is the Social Justice Organization, Environmental Justice Organization in, in Riverside County. They've been active by the time we showed up for about 25 years. Everyone knew them. They fought against you know, landfills, um, incinerators, and other environmental hazards that were facing these low-income Latino communities. And they had a very active presence in the community in about five precincts. So this is only five precincts in Riverside County where the organization was the most well-known. The, the women who worked for the campaign and went door to door were women who had worked for CCAJ for a long time, so they knew the neighborhood. They, they were known. They'd get to someone's house and say, hi, I'm here from CCAJ. And the person would say, oh, Penny Newman's group. I love the work you guys are doing. So there's a very like trusted source, very uh, strong credibility thing going on there, which I'll talk about some more later. And then, on the morning of the election, the, the women who worked for the group, the promotoras, went door to door with the intention of putting door hanger reminders on people's doors. So at about 5 o'clock in the morning, they started going around to those places where they had encountered somebody again. Uh, but then they ended up running into people anyway, because people were walking their dogs, or taking out the garbage, or actually heading out to work. And so in many cases, it was two contacts which again turns out to be important, and I'll talk about that again later. So all this stuff that, you know, five years later we went back and said, all this stuff is really important. Source credibility, two contacts, right? Uh, all this stuff that's really important, they just did it by kind of by accident, their first try. And so as you can see, voting in the control group in the June 2006 election was only 11.1%, but voting in the treatment group was 19.6%, for an intent to treat effect, ITT of, of 8.5 percentage points, which is already amazing. Then you take into effect the contact rate. In other words, they only actually successfully contacted 19.7% of the people that they wanted to contact. More than 80% of the people they wanted to talk to weren't home. And so if you factor that in using two square, two stage least square regression, it's basically like dividing the intent to treat effect by the contact rate, you get a treat, treated on, treatment on treated effect or a complier average effect of over 43 percentage points. That persists even when controlling for other information like voter history. Um, one of the things about ex randomized experiments is technically you don't need covariates, but they do help you pinpoint uh, hetero, heterogeneity in your results or how robust they are to these things, and so it turns out this is a very robust finding. Uh, so Penny Newman and her staff were super excited about this finding, and we were too, and it really helped us, really helped us overcome a lot of hesitancy by some of the groups, like, we have to work with you because the James Irvine Foundation is making us, but we don't like you. We don't want to be graded. We don't want you to look at what we're doing. There's a lot of mistrust, and after this, and they realized that maybe what they were doing was gonna work and that we were gonna say nice things about them and maybe the James Irvine Foundation would give them more money. We had a lot more credibility as the evaluation team with the groups, which was really helpful. Uh, Excuse me. Yeah. Did that mean the previous thing, that 43% of the people that you actually contacted voted? It means that if we actually talk to you, your likelihood of voting increased by 43%. Oh, your likelihood of voting increased by 43%. Cool. All right, we tried a lot of stuff in June 2006. One of the things we tried was postcards with pictures of Jesus and the Virgin Mary on them. Because remember, the experiments that had been done in the first five years all showed that mail didn't work. But mail would be so great if we could make it work, because it's so much cheaper. You don't have to worry about people staying on script. You just send people the postcards. So we thought, well, Catholic voters won't throw away postcard with Jesus on it, they'll look at it and that'll influence them. Like, we, we have the title, right, of our book already, People Won't Throw Away Jesus. It was going to be the greatest experiment, except it didn't work. Mm -hmm. We sent people these awesome postcards with, with pictures <coughs> on them and quotes from the Catholic Conference of Bishops about how voting is a Catholic duty. Did not, did not work. Uh, we sent handwritten notes from priests. Did not work. Uh, turns out we could not use Catholic guilt to make people vote. If the priest had done the canvassing, that might have 
Right, but then that doesn't that doesn't give you that benefit of male, right? They would all become evangelicals. <laughs> So uh, we couldn't get we couldn't get mail to work, and all the mail stuff we did didn't work. All sorts of postcards and leaflets and all these ideas we had for making mail work, telling people where their polling place place was, giving them easy to understand information about the candidates, highlighting differences in the issue positions of the voter, totally didn't work. Um, we went back um, in two thousand and eight to. Uh, to CCAJ, and you'll see that here in Riverside they continue to have a really robust effect. Uh, but then when they expanded to San Bernardino, it didn't work. And so I want to say a couple things about this slide. First, um, they were so excited about the people that they mobilized to vote in 2006 that they wouldn't let us randomize those people. Uh, they, right, it would have been bad for their organization. They thought, well, we talked to these people in 2006. How can we not go back to and talk to them again? So we removed them from the randomization and they went and talked to all those voters again. And so this was only an experiment on people who they had not successfully contacted in 2006, which probably is part of the reason it's not 43% again. But actually, 15.7% um, is still huge. Hello, it's only supposed to be 7 to 12. You're not supposed to get. So they were super disappointed, they're like, why didn't we get 43? I thought we were so good at this. Um, because that's not normal. It's like re regression to the mean. So they had not taken statistics, I guess, or had forgotten their statistics. Uh, but, but it still worked really well in Riverside, doing the same thing of sending the promotoras to the core five precincts. But also because they had been so successful in 2006, they wanted to do it more. Right? And so they hired a bunch of new staff, and they went to the neighboring county, San Bernardino, where they did not have a known presence. And they were hiring women who didn't know their way around. They were not a, you know, a cohesive group. They hadn't been with CCAJ very long. And so what we noticed in our observations, because this is 2008, right? So we've got observers out with them. The quality of the canvassing in Riverside and San Bernardino was very different. Even though they were technically doing the same thing. They were technically all going door to door, delivering the same script, saying the same thing to contacted voters, but the women in San Bernardino were getting lost. The contacted voters in San Bernardino didn't know who CCAJ was. It just wasn't the same, right? The quality of the contacts wasn't the same, and so, unfortunately, uh, it didn't work. And this is one of the things about door-to-door -door campaigns that we found over, over our 300 experiments is that door-to-door -door can be super powerful and super effective, but it can also fail and it has a high variability in terms of success. It's very hard to supervise and maintain quality control of door-to-door -door canvassers. It's much easier to supervise people in a phone bank because you can be right there. And in between calls you can say, uh, then don't forget I mean, from now on, like if you could say it this way instead of that way, right? And then you can mid-correct. And then you can have the canvassers, and I've, and I've had this happen to me multiple times where we'll take a break and I'll say, you know, how are the calls going? And people say, you know, the script's really awkward right here, so can we change how we're supposed to say it? Because that just doesn't really work. It sounds really dorky. And I would not know that if I had just sent them out to canvas for eight hours and then they come back and it didn't work. Um, and so both ways, the communication both ways of a phone bank really is much better. Uh, we have found over time that trusted messengers really work, and here's your political science -y theory slide, right? We should have known this to begin with, but just in, you know, as a reminder, uh, we know from Anthony Downs that people are more likely to heed information from a trusted source. We, we know from uh, folks who do persuasion and political communication studies that Trust and credibility are really important. Uh, if you are trying to persuade somebody to do something or to change their mind about something, it's important to be seen as credible. And so the credibility of who's delivering the message logically should matter. And we found that in a bunch of our experiments. So here's a couple of those experiments. This first one is St. Lucie's, and that's a, a congregation, a Catholic church in Long Beach, so this is part of the Pico National Network. And um, 
people who were assigned to the control group in this election, I think this is in 2006, uh, people in the control group, only 6.7% of them voted, which is just so depressing, but 6.7% turnout is actually the turnout rate of this community. Uh, people who were contacted by a phone call from somebody else in the congregation were more likely to vote, so turnout in that group was 7.5%. And people who were contacted by somebody that they knew personally from the congregation were much more likely to vote, turnout was 9.1%. So as the credibility of the source increased from being a, just somebody here in your same church, to somebody you know, your turnout is, uh, is higher. Uh, and we saw this in other stuff as well, where if it's somebody you personally know, uh, Tiffany Davenport has done some experiments with emails, where usually email doesn't work, but if you get an email from your friend, that's a huge effect. Um, and I'll talk about my email thing in a minute. Uh, Scope did an experiment in South LA, and so remember this is an inner city, pretty dense community. And they had people walking door to door, and then they, they mat we matched in our analysis whether a person was knocking on doors in their own zip code, or if they were in another zip code, but still in the community known as South LA. And so it turned out that if you were contacted by what we call the stranger, which was still a neighbor, broadly speaking, but just someone from the broader South Central uh, community, your increased effect, the boost to your likelihood of turning out was only 5.2%. If you were contacted by somebody who lived in your same zip code, it was 8.5%. There's a definite boost to being contacted. And this wasn't necessarily people they know, right, because we asked the canvassers, is it because you knew them? And that was very infrequent. Like, you know, a couple of people actually canvassed someone they knew. But it, it makes sense, right, if you just think about, like, in your own community. I know the faces in my community, partly because I have dogs, right? So I kind of know who lives in my couple blocks. And I can imagine that they recognize me. And so if I went to their door, even though I don't really know them, they'll know, like, oh, she is our neighbor, right? We know that lady. Having a dog actually also helps. It's a little bit off topic, but I found that if you're walking your dog, people just assume you're local. Like you couldn't have put the dog in the car. Um, so I used to take my dog with me everywhere to canvas, uh, which is very fun, especially if a pit bull comes at you, because then the dog is distracted by the dog and not, and you can hit him with your clipboard until the owner comes out. Uh, is that in the book? I hope so. It was really exciting. We, my canvassers got attacked by all sorts of things. Birds, Canada geese are extremely violent. Uh, and there were definitely some dog episodes. Uh, and only one pair of canvassers got robbed. That happened too. Send your canvassers out with a buddy. Okay, um, and then this is not on Latino voters, but I've done some other experiments with email and, and found the same idea of a trusted messenger mattering because uh, we did an experiment where half the people got an email from me, Melissa Michelson, president of People for the Advancement of Voter Engagement, P-A-V-E, paving a way to a better tomorrow. It's good, right? Or from the registrar, who had been elected multiple times, had been the registrar for 25 years, was a trusted source. Turns out emails from him worked and mine did not, even though I had a really cool slogan. Um, so consistently we found in the experiments where we were able to test it that a stranger, a trusted source, a neighbor was more effective. Um, just a, a, yeah. Just super, super interesting. I'm going <laughs> back on lots of questions. But uh, the registrar effect seems trust, but the neighbor effect, it's not so clear that that's a trust as opposed to solidarity kind of. I mean, there's other mechanisms that could be with people who you think are in your immediate neighborhood besides trust that, that is mistrust means you think some, they're pulling a line on you there. It's a scam. It's, right. And if they're the same kind of people, just so I'm not sure why trust would be the dimension. So my question is, is there anything that actually shows that the mechanism involved with neighbors is that you trust people who live in your zip code but not people in the adjoining zip code? Do you trust them more? I don't 
I don't have any proof of the mechanism. Okay, that's this doll post hoc theorizing. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm It'd be an interesting thing to good. think about. Yeah. I'll be here for a couple days. Maybe we can talk about yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Maybe it's something else. We called it trust. Perfectly legitimate. I just, okay. <laughs> I'm not, this wasn't, I'm not skeptical, right. especially. I'm just, I got it. All right. <laughs> also, we found that two phone calls was super powerful. Okay, so I have to start with the story, which is. Right, we're just starting in 2006. Southwest Voter Registration Education Project didn't do an experiment in June 2006. They, didn't, they weren't ready. So they did their experiment in November 2006. And they come back and they increase turnout with their phone call campaign by 10 percentage points. And if you remember like half an hour ago, I told you that what we thought would happen back in 2005 was that a phone call campaign would increase turnout maybe two to five percentage points. So uh, Arturo Gonzalez is saying, you know, here's our data, and I'm like, wait, 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 you increased turnout 10 percentage points, how did you do that? And he was a little resistant to tell us the secret sauce. Um, he eventually gave us access to all of their call logs and all their information, and it turned out that what they were doing, because they had always done it this way, is they would call people two, three weeks before the election, and then whoever they had contacted, they would call them again right before the election, the weekend or the day before the election, and just remind them again. They wouldn't necessarily say, we're reminding you, but it would, was a second phone call from Southwest Voter to the same person, and often from the same canvasser. So how do we know if that is the magic? We had to do two rounds of randomization. So in June 2008, we did an experiment where uh, they contacted people, they tried to contact people, then we had all the people who had successfully been contacted, and we randomized them again. So some people were left at just one phone call, and then some people got two on purpose, and it's the second call. Um, and so we have done a bunch of theorizing about why we think that happens, but basically that, you know, we're watching you, and you've made a promise, and you feel really compelled to follow through, and and you're reminded of the early conversation. But so consistently in a number of experiments, we found that a two-round phone bank is super powerful. Sorry? Is there a uh, question? Yeah, you know, I it came a little late, but since you are connecting it to what might happen in the future, what happened there, one question I have is that the, what are you supposed to do in canvassing or what you, should you do? You know, in the 2008 election, you know, you have, it's a, it was a unique election. I came here to find out how can we do that for the future. And I want you to tell me what are the things you tell in canvassing, what, are the, what is the role of the canvassing and the phone bank? Mm -hmm. And what are the, uh, you know, what are the situation? Phone bank, from my experience, I actually turned out a huge Latino population, you see, here in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. You see, and, uh, but what, what do you do in the, in the phone banks? You know, you have a script, sometimes it doesn't make any sense. You see, right. and um, the contact, how you, I need you great answers more than what I, I do, what I did. Well, one of the things that I, I've learned from these phone banks is that it's important to listen to the canvassers. And if the canvassers are telling you, these phone scripts don't make sense, you need to change what you're saying because this is awkward, then you need to listen to your workers. But my, my question is, uh, you know, it seems to be that, that campaigning that has been done is for many, many years the same thing. I'm sorry, should I don't agree. I've seen, way I've seen that campaigns have shifted dramatically in response to the work that I and other get out the vote camp, camp uh, experimenters are doing. They figured out that what we're doing shows them how to get out the vote more effectively. Wait, but you over and over are coming back and saying things that uh, when you contact the person the first time, mm -hmm. you see, what are the things you should tell them? Uh, that's, that's one of my questions to be able to follow up. Another question I have for you. I'm sorry, I'm not what, what, is, what is the main information you do in the first meeting? So what should you say? What's the most effective yeah. script? I promise that's coming. But most of the time when we did these campaigns and we tried all these different scripts in 2006 and 2008, 
we were not finding any message effect. We were finding that despite the fact that the scripts were all kinds of different scripts, they pretty much had the same size effect. So I had four different organizations do two round phone banks with four very different scripts, and they had about the same effect on turnout. So that didn't seem to matter, but I have a new answer from later. It didn't seem to matter by 2008 what you were saying. No, it would be back. Wait, hopefully I'll get an answer that you like better by the time I get to the last slide. I've got like 11 more slides. So, okay, so that totally worked, that was exciting. Another thing we found was that voting was habit forming. So because this was a longitudinal study and we had unique voter ID numbers for all the people in California, we could track them over time even if they weren't in an experiment the next election. And we found that there was this habit formation effect, that if you mobilized someone to vote and you got them to vote once, they were 38% uh, 30, more likely to vote in the November 2008 election just because maybe now they knew what to do, maybe now they were on the radar of campaigns as a likely voter, maybe because they lost the anxiety of messing up, like, which we all had post-2000, I don't want to go to vote for Pat Buchanan by mistake, whatever it was, uh, whatever it is that's going on, people were uh, thinking of themselves as voters the next time and were voting even if we didn't remind them. So that was very exciting stuff. Um, we, we talk a lot in the book about the importance of norms, right? There's an injunctive norm about voting that you all are told in elementary school and are told by the society you should vote, good citizens vote, you should vote, and yet you look around and you see nobody's voting. So your descriptive norm, sorry, yeah, your descriptive norm doesn't match the injunctive norm. Um, but if we can overcome that and uh, get people to believe that they should be performing the behavior, um, we can get the descriptive norm to match the injunctive norm, then people will vote. I'm not explaining that very well. Um, but in the vote, we talk about what we call the sociocultural cognition model, which is basically that people start to think of themselves as voters, that the, they are redefining citizenship by saying, I'm a citizen. Citizens aren't just white people. Citizens are me. Citizens are Latinos. Citizens are Asian American. So I'm a voter too, and it's election time, so I'm going to vote. And we think that the habit formation effects we find are very strong evidence that people are adopting these new identities as voters. So that's kind of where we were in 2008. The book came out in 2012 because, you know, these things take a while. But basically this research stops in 2008. And what we know at this time is that direct messages work and indirect messages don't. Right? All the stuff we tried with leaflets and letters and all that stuff didn't work. Other people have tried even more creative indirect sorts of messages like billboards in Texas. Um, but this is what works, right? Menlo students huddled around a table on their cell phones calling people in a supervised environment with a standard script with lots of leftover Halloween candy to keep them going. Um, this gets out the vote. So there's something about that personal contact, right? That when I reach out and contact you and I say, Ben, I want you to vote, you feel like you're being invited into the polity. Maybe elections aren't just about white people. Maybe elections are about me, too, and my community, too. So I'm going to vote. Now I'm feeling included. I'm feeling invited in, right? It's like that, I don't know if it's apocryphal or true about that story about Tip O'Neill and his neighbor, right, where uh, he asks his neighbor if she voted for him, and she says no. And he said, what? You didn't vote for me? Well, you didn't ask. You have to ask people. If you ask people, they will vote. So it turns out they will vote, but you have to make that personal connection. You have to reach out to them. It seems like this sort of thing, even if it seems really powerful and persuasive to us, um, don't. Um, so that was our conclusion, but that left me with some unanswered questions. So I've been continuing <coughs> to do work post-California Votes Initiative, trying to answer a couple of questions. Does the message matter? So getting at your question. Does what you say matter? Because it seems like from the California Votes Initiative that it wasn't working. We tried all sorts of different scripts about um, you know, ethnic solidarity and civic duty. If you don't vote, the terrorists win. Like All sorts of different messages about the importance of participating. We tried 
telling people what a city council does and so why it's important to vote in a city council election. Um, but we couldn't find any message effects that were statistically significant. We wanted to know if nativity mattered, whether there were different effects on US born um, or naturalized Latinos. And we wanted to know, I wanted to know, how about outside of California? Because really, apart from the uh, acorn experiments in places like um, Maricopa County, Arizona, there were very little. There was very little being done with Latino voters outside of of California. Although California is awesome, right? So one uh, set of experiments I've done is with a former grad student at Stanford and now professor at at Princeton, Ali Valenzuela. And uh, the idea with these experiments was whether it would matter if we reached out to people as Latinos or as Americans. So still reaching out to only Latinos, but cueing different identities, and whether different identities would work for different people. The idea was that a Latino identity cueing message would maybe work for less acculturated Latinos, more Spanish dominant Latinos, less uh, lower income Latinos, and maybe an American message would work for the more English dominant, acculturated, uh, right? That's our theory, so we tried that in two states, once in California in 2010 and once in Texas in 2012. And as you can see, we used the placebo as, of recycling as so many political scientists do. And this is just the overall effects, but already we see some indication that the message does matter, right? So even you know, the differences between the American message and the Latino message are small. Clearly, either message is more effective at getting people to vote than telling them to recycle, which is reassuring. Telling people to recycle should not increase voter turnout. Uh, but the Latino message is even stronger, and there are even bigger subgroup effects if you look at low-income, Spanish-dominant Latinos. And so if we put in more individual data and look for heterogeneous effects, the Latino message is even more powerful among people who we would expect, based on their demographics, to have a stronger Latino identity. Yeah. Just to, for clarification, is that saying that if you gave, if you provided a recycling message, you would turn out, you'd have a 30.5 percent increase in voter turnout? Oh, sorry, no, that's not well labeled. It means that the base voter rate, so the people who we told to recycle, 30.5 percent of them voted in that election in Texas. So we're only, so we're, this is how, what percentage voted. In okay, each and then if, so what's the second column, the American? So that's what percentage voted if we said to them, hi, I'm calling you from the American Voter Project. It's really important that all Americans have their voice heard. I'm calling you from the Latino Voter Project. It's important that all Latinos make their voice heard. Okay, um, I got it. So, so there's a. 1.8 or 5.5 .5 increase. Yeah, so there's, so there's definitely a bump, especially in Texas. Well, in both states, there's definitely a bump from the Latino message, but it's even bigger, and it's really non-existent for the wealthier English-dominant folks. Um, so in the paper, which, you know, stay tuned, will be published soon, uh, we give all the subgroup effects, but the table makes really tiny numbers on the screen. So. Could I ask one more follow-up for the yeah. this? So I remember, actually, from a course that Ben and um, Franco Scarano taught um, Latino politics. Remember that, way back when? They had lots of survey data, and one of the most interesting findings for me was the degree to which people identify themselves more readily as, say, Dominican or Cuban or Mexican yeah. before, way before Latino, right? Right. Um, and in fact, they're more likely to see themselves as American than Latino, but most likely, to, again, like distinct national origins. Right. And I'm wondering to what degree that you did that in this. We didn't, we just said Latino, but we should totally do that. Yeah. It's actually one of the things I was talking about with folks last week in Chicago at the Midwest is we need to start doing those scripts. You know, if we could get enough people in each group. Obviously, uh, in these two areas where we were, we were in LA and uh, Hidalgo County, Texas, it's mostly Mexicans. Yeah. So we could have tried Mexican American instead of, but then, I mean, we were trying, yeah, we were trying to be inclusive by saying Latino, or in Texas we said Hispanic, but I think you're right, we'd probably get really interesting different effects if we could say, it's really important for the Dominican But then community. you'd have to know they're Dominican. Well, you can find that out. Okay. You'd be amazed how much data they have on you. Okay. Like, so we can look that up. So this would also bear heavily on what the character of the mechanism is, because the category Latino voting is a politically salient public category. 
Mm -hmm. There's a lot of discussion. You know, Republicans are taught, but not all the subgroups. Right. So if you invoke Latino, you're also invoking, participating in what is a national political issue. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you invoke Dominican or you know other some other subgroup, you would be just tapping into their ethnic cultural identity. And it would but be not, more of a not the trusted messenger enough. thing. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 you get it, it would be a more confusing message, I think. Yeah. To a lot to some people, vote. Uh, a Latino Vote Association sounds like a legitimate organization that's part of this <laughs> effort to expand the political weight of Latinos, whereas a Guatemala Vote Association seems will seem like an ethno cultural organization, or some, I don't know what it will seem. It just it won't have the it wouldn't seem to me to have the same symbolic weight in the political arena. But it might be more salient to people and thus be more effective just because they're like, oh, that's my people. I gotta be there for my people. I don't know. And a lot of people don't identify as Latino. I, I know, but the, it's not that they don't the issue isn't whether they identify as Latino, but the Latino mobilization is a public political phenomenon. Right? That, not a, yeah. That's talked about by politicians. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, yeah. check back with me in a couple years yeah. and hopefully I'll have an updated answer. <laughs> Did you want to ask me something else? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, the, all nationalities in Latin America are kind of have the same thing as here, like patriotism, exaggerated. So for me, I work more trying to unite them all and see that the similarities more than the differences and groups, big groups, and I organized huge parties where we emphasized that we are more similar than different, and you get out lots of people together because you change their mind. That yeah, Because in a conversation, conversation, and you start identifying, I am from this country, this country, this country, you know, we have been taught, you know, that oh, we are, this is better than this, and the history, that so forth, you know, becomes in the middle and each goes to their own corner. And I tell them it's straight, and I'm not going to tell you where I'm from. You see, because you and I understand each other. You see, we're talking the same language. We eat the same, we feel the same. Uh, and then all of a sudden they realize, and they, they are very receptive, and, and they work together. Mm -hmm. So that would predict that the Latino message would be better than an ethnic, than a national origin group message. Well, you know, I'm just saying yeah. this situation. As far as the word Latino, as long as, you know, I'm, I'm making a phone call, I'm going to say, you never know who you're talking to. Or, or, oh, or we know who we're talking, talking to. to the public. You know, you're writing a letter, you, you know, and you can't identify the specific country, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I have worked with many nationalities together. And there was just one experience where, where there was a difference between Hispanic, Latino, and then someone from Spain, the only person who didn't like this terminology of Latino, you know, and, and so forth. Yeah. But Ali and I had a huge debate about that because I insisted that in Texas we use Hispanic mm -hmm. instead of Latino. He wanted to use Latino in both to be consistent because you know how we want to try to replicate the experiment, but I you know Hispanic. It's a huge fight. So any of you familiar with Texas are like, duh. So luckily Ali listened to me. All right, sorry, moving right along. I only have a couple more slides. We're almost done, and then we can ask some more questions. Um, Lisa and I then went back and looked at some of the data, so some of you may know that it used to be that immigrants were less likely to vote than US-born citizens. So looking at Latino voter turnout, immigrants were less likely to vote. They have been politicized by political context, and now we see consistently that immigrants are more likely to vote. So here we're just looking at how receptive are they to these get out the vote campaigns? Looking back at uh, the successful campaigns from the California Votes Initiative for both Latinos and Asian Americans. And what we found is that it matters um, that the foreign born Latinos who we were targeting were not really moved by the get out the vote campaign. We suspect that it's because they've already been politicized. They're already more likely to vote than other Latinos because they already realize that politics is of importance to their lives. Mm -hmm. But US-born Latinos were impacted more strongly. 
And then the reverse was true for Asian Americans, which we speculate in the paper, uh, this is an international migration review, where we speculate that that's because the immigration debates and the targeting of immigrants in this country has mostly been lat latinicized or latinicized, however you want, would want to pronounce that, but that when you think of an immigrant in this country, you think of a, of a Latino, and so Asian Americans don't feel as attacked, haven't been politicized, and so for them, the outreach is more powerful. Um, so it does seem to matter whether you're US born or native born. And I'm also continuing to be interested in whether this works in other places. Um, so I've done one experiment that I can share with you so far, and this was in Oregon last year for Measure 88. You might remember that uh, some states have been trying to give driver's licenses to undocumented immigrants. There was a measure on the ballot in Oregon last fall to do this. And so I worked with an organization in Oregon to target Latino voters and tell them to vote. And it worked. Uh, the, the differences are statistically significant here. Right. Small but statistically significant. It was a small effort. Uh, it was not a hugely well-funded organization. And the contact rate is pretty small. As you can see, they only contacted 394 people. But um, it worked, and so even in Oregon, which there are not a lot of Latinos in Oregon, right? It's a pretty small part of the population, um, but even for them, reaching out to them as a Latino voter organization and saying, we need to get the Latino voice out for this measure, super important, that worked. I've been talking to some people about some stuff in Nebraska. Nebraska is maybe not necessarily where you think of like, ah, oh, huge Latino population, we've got to get them out to vote, but of course, uh, like many new destination states, um, it's increasing. Um, and so I'm continuing to work with some groups in, in Omaha to try to, to find out what worked there. Again, you'll have to check back with me later. I don't actually have an answer about whether it worked. The change in the white turn to vote is significant. Well, it's the populate. This is just the population. Oh, I'm sorry. I haven't, I don't have data for the no, experiment no. to share with you yet. Right, but, but this is just showing you like, they are increasing, an increasingly large share of the population, and so they are of interest. And already they're about 10%. And so they are, in fact, a lot of Latinos in Omaha. So we're trying to get them out to vote. Um, but I don't have any answers yet. So uh, everyone should go vote. <coughs> Voting is really awesome. Uh, you can dance about it. And, uh, if you send them the postcard with that on it. Right? That's pretty Jesus. sexy. I would vote for that. I don't, I don't know. I would try that. They wouldn't vote for Jesus, though. So I don't know. Um, yeah, more and more experiments need to be done. Uh, but that's what we've figured out so far. So thank you. Yes? So I, I have a, a thought, and then this could bear on another kind of treatment effect. I know that when canvases come to my door, if I feel they're volunteers, I take them much more seriously than if I think they're paid canvassers. Yeah. And I think the moral quality that's created is they're making an effort and a sacrifice because they believe in something. They're a volunteer. And they're just a mercenary if they are paid. Yeah, um, we proved that with experiments. It's not my work, but David right. Nickerson has done that, where he had volunteers and then a paid commercial phone bank. And then he trained the volunteers to act like paid canvassers, where they had, had quotas, they had to get through their list, and they had to talk really fast. And he trained the commercial phone bank to act like volunteers, to slow down, to be conversational, to not worry about how many people they are reaching, to just be really enthusiastic. And he swapped. So if you act like a volunteer, right, so I you just wonder if you just inform. And you lie. No, no, no. <laughs> they have volunteers that yeah. say, I'm a volunteer for the campaign. Yeah, we haven't tested that, but we know that when people act like a volunteer and they're conversational and they seem really authentic, that they're effective. And if they sound paid, if they sound like they're just trying to get through the script and, and they don't really care, then they're not effective. And that's one of the things we saw with the qualitative work as well, is that if you didn't seem like you really cared, you know, if you're a high school student and you're chomping your gum and, and you didn't get out the vote because you weren't really trying. And one generic difference between phone banking and this is that in general, the person eye contact of an interpersonal thing might have more of that character 
right. regardless. The phone thing seemed more like it's scripted and it's... Yeah. And door-to-door -door canvassing is better for organizations who are trying to build their organization beyond just getting out the vote and trying to build a community presence and maybe let people know that they're there and, and do other things. So I still recommend that groups do door-to-door -door canvassing, but that to keep in mind, it's really hard to supervise. It can be, you know, there are dangerous things happen with people getting attacked by dogs or wild geese or thieves. and Like, stuff happens that you can't control for, so there are kind of more risks and it's more variable, but also can be way more powerful, can really build your community presence, can help build social trust and social capital. Like, there's all kinds of good reasons to do it, plus people these days don't answer the phone. <laughs> There's a whole different talk that I give about what do we do about people not answering the phone anymore. Um, so door-to-door -door canvassing can still be a good way to go, and I think it's that personal contact that's so deep that you don't you don't get on the phone. So I see you, I, but you had your hand up first, so I'll go back to you. Um, you're not from here, but <laughs> voter ID uh, just oh, uh, finally took effect here. Yeah. Um, we're. I'm going to meet with the Government Accountability Board, which is the, the statewide thing that runs our elections, although really they're run locally. So I thought, even though I realized that locally we're going to try to work with community groups to go door to door to identify people, the, the GAB has a list of people who are registered voters who do not have voter ID. They know who they are. So. Um, you know, being a civic organization, uh, I thought we should try to encourage the Government Accountability Board to at least mail these people and say, you know, if you want to vote next year, you will need a voter ID and this is how you get them. Do you think that that is just totally useless and we just have to do phone banking and community door to door? Or do you think that there's actually some effect from getting a mailing from a government organization that tells you if you want to be able to vote, in the past, you didn't need a voter ID, but now you do. I think you should do it, and you should have a control group, and then you should check if it worked. I would theorize that it would work, but if you could hold out 10 or 15% of them as a control group, then you could prove it. And then, next time there's an election, you could say, see, it worked, so now we need you to email, or now we need you to send mail to everybody. So if you can do it for an election that's not as important first, and then do it for the general in 2016. Once you've proved that it works, then you'd be able to say, look, it worked. You need to send letters to everyone. Well, uh, the poor Government Accountability Board, they, they can't. They can't care if it worked. Um, it's just if you could get another organization to do it. I mean, they, But the organization would care if it worked as well. Right, right, right. right. They would care. Right? Because they would want to know, is this right. worth bugging people about? Is this worth all the postage and the printing? Right. So, so I would if we had an organ if we did it if the GAB won't do it and we have to do it as an organization and get funding we should do it as a research project. You should do it. You should pull out a control group and prove it because then, right? And if you know your friendly neighborhood political scientist can probably help you with that if you need it, but it's not that hard. You just right. randomly pull out a control group and then afterwards look and see who who voted. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but well, yeah, well, theoretically, got an ID. theoretically it should work, right? Because it'll be a reminder to vote, and it'll be a reminder that they have to do something before it's too late. And so it, well, it wouldn't be, I mean, it's so horrible <laughs> to get an ID. You have to send it so early, right? way so before the election. Quick, because, send the letters now. Yeah. You should, right. totally, you should totally do that. It would be okay, a really... So you do think it's worth it? Yeah. Okay. I think it would work. Okay. Because. Because the other people in my organization are saying it, it's not even worth asking them. Because What's your organization? I, I'm with the League of Women Voters. I've heard of you. Yeah. I've heard of oh. you guys too. Well, that's you think good. The, you think has. mailing would work for this for the voter ID thing, even though mailing you said didn't work? Okay. Well, mailing with Jesus didn't work, but email from the registrar worked, right? And there's been some mail that I didn't talk about because it's not on Latino voters, but there's been some mail that uses uh, social monitoring that works. It says, we know how you voted, we know how your neighbors voted, uh, here's how you compare, we're gonna send you another postcard after the election. That pisses people off though. Um, Costas Panagopoulos has done a, a new version of that where it, he tested 
a postcard with eyeballs, a postcard with an American flag, a postcard with a palm tree, and the eyeballs worked, yes. right? Just like Tony the Tiger makes you buy Frosted Flakes, a postcard with eyeballs on it makes you vote. Um, so mail can work, but mail targeting Latino voters, I don't have anything on that. Um, right, no, logically, no, right, logically the social pressure stuff should work, but we don't want to do that because then people call the police. Um, but law, but mail from a trusted source has worked with email, and Chris Mann has done a whole lot of experiments with women voters, women's voices, women vote, what is it, MVMB? Email me, I'll look it up. Anyway, Chris Mann has done a bunch of unpublished experiments using mail. And you can make mail work, um, and, the, and there are some best practices there in terms of, for example, don't make it a glossy four-color thing, make it look really official, put it in a really plain-looking envelope, because then people think it's official and will open it, versus people get a glossy postcard and they just think it's garbage because it's a commercial. Um, and he, working with, I think it's called Women's Voices, Women Vote. Um, he and that group have done a ton of unpublished work. Um, that I continue to harass him about getting published in a journal uh, that shows how to make mail work without annoying people, specifically targeting uh, single mothers and people of color. So, you should talk to Chris. Okay, Ben, your turn. Uh, I, I, um, I'm next. Okay, sorry, let's look at this side of the room too. I, I seem to remember something from your book for you, where you talked about um, the quality of the canvassers and I thought, uh, and I thought what you said was different from what was in the book, and you, I thought in the book you said that, that you really have to have, I mean, it really pays to have paid canvassers, because volunteers tend to be more lax, they don't stay in the script. You have the example of one, uh, one woman who spent like 25 minutes talking to a friend of hers on the porch, uh, instead of, you know, giving the message. And saying how her daughter was fat, yeah, that probably didn't help. And, and, then, and, then, moving, and then moving on. You know, uh, uh, that wasn't really a paid versus unpaid. That the, the point of that chapter is about how the quality does matter. And for example, in 2008, a big problem that many of these organizations had in November 2008, but also February, is groups were so excited to get out the vote for Barack Obama, that, or to get out the vote for Democrats, that they didn't want to do work for the James Irvine Foundation groups because that had to be nonpartisan. So all of these experiments are nonpartisan. We could never say you should vote yes on this measure, you should vote for de the Democrats, you should vote for Barack Obama. We could not say that. You could target low-income <coughs> African-American voters and just see who they vote, but you couldn't tell them. And you should vote because Obama's, like, come on, right? Um, so because of that, many individuals who normally would have worked with Naleo or Southwest Voter or these other groups went and worked for the Democratic Party or for a candidate. And we had to go out and hire, these groups had to go out and hire like high school kids. And so they were paid, but they were crap. Because like the ones CCAJ hired, they didn't even get the acronym right sometimes. And then the person would say, well, what's CCAJ? And they wouldn't know what the acronym stood for. Uh, not surprisingly, those canvassers were ineffective. So it's really more about quality than about whether or not you're paid. Uh, quality, quality, quality so is job one, quality, right? Quality, quality counts. Volunteers. You can have quality volunteers in other ways. Well, yeah, if they're committed, if they care, yeah, right? I thought, I, mean, I thought there was just some tension between volunteers, for example, and staff who were paid. Well, that was scope. So what's, yeah, scope does, does have a, a questionable um, policy where they have paid workers and then they have volunteers on the weekend and it's, there's, there's some weirdness going on there. Uh, but that's just that one group and yeah, I, we talked to them about that. And Cabezan, like was super mean to their canvassers sometimes and so, like that's not helping. Like if you make your canvassers feel bad, they're not gonna do a good job. That seems like a bad policy to make your canvassers miserable. I know, well so what happened was the first couple of rounds, Cabezan wasn't getting out the vote. And they were really kind of freaking out, right? James Irvine Foundation is giving them millions of dollars and they're not getting out the vote. And they were like, what can we do? And so they started imposing all these new rules on the canvassers and like threatening them, like we're gonna call people and, and check that you really contacted them. We think you're faking your sheets. And we're just like, no, don't think that's helping. And there was a lot of other stuff going on. And so they continued to not be effective. So, <laughs> should be 
nice. They're like CCHA, part of their magic in Riverside was they were so nice to their canvassers. They would like have a potluck every night. They had childcare available with like toys and coloring books for the kids. It was like a group of people who felt really happy about coming to work and walking for eight hours, right? If you want people to do a good job walking door to door for hours, you really have to be nice to them and make them feel appreciated. Like, duh. No, like, you're all like, well, duh. But, uh, not everyone seems to know it. Your turn. Well, I, I do have a couple of questions, or related questions, but I'll just comment on this too. Um, I was a paid canvasser and canvas director way awesome. back when, um, but not for Get Out the Vote. And it did matter how much effort or time you took to talk to people as opposed to just burning through territory, yeah. in which case oftentimes people wouldn't even know what the group was. And if you came to that same house a year later, they'll say, oh, you were here la just last month, because they can't distinguish between groups. Right. So anyway, that I could say a whole heck of a lot. Yeah, but it's that. the same idea, like it's quality. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so anyway, that wasn't my question. Okay. I have, I mean, so I have two related questions, and they both, and, and they're both with respect to um, the literature in general and your work specifically and how it might fit into it. So one is sort of a, the negative, side of the equation. I'm wondering what you might have learned about why, why people don't vote. Um, so, and I'm wondering to what degree it, it's real, I mean, people even are influenced by the two editions of the Piven and Cloward books on um, why Americans don't vote. And then the second one was why Americans still don't vote. Um, and so I'm curious to what degree you learned anything about that negative side of the story, as opposed to what makes people vote? What, what's the, what are the continuing obstacles? And then the second question, which is related to this, is, and it also speaks to this question of other places, I'm wondering what comparisons are made to other countries where people vote at, especially European countries that vote at much higher levels, and what k kinds of comparisons or contrasts might you learn about the incentives or disincentives to voting? I mean, what explains the difference between the U.S. and these other places? So it's, again, it's related to the why Americans don't vote. As an experimental experimenter, I tend to not put a lot of faith in people's explanations for why they don't vote. Because what you say might not necessarily, you might not really know why you don't vote, but you'll come up with some reason. So I think the only thing I can say about the motivation of voting versus not voting is because we're going to these non voters and making them into voters, that there's something about feeling like I am part of this. This is about me too, and it's not just about wealthy white people, that this is about me and my community too. Um, that so that part of the reason people don't vote is they think, well, voting's not about me. Vote, this isn't something that, that we do in my community. And you can even see this um, in some of the neighborhoods we canvassed, right? In the, some of the neighborhoods, you could see how obvious this was because you'd be, if you're in the white, wealthier neighborhood, there's lawn signs and bumper stickers, and there's a visible sign that an election is happening. But in most of the communities we were in, except for November 08, there was no indication that it was election season. So it like reinforces this idea that election is happening, but it's not even something that's for us, so why would we participate? But if I come to your house and I have a memorable conversation with you, you feel like it is about you. So there's an assumption that there's a, people feel racially excluded. Yeah. And so, and so if we make the them feel included. The message is you are not. Yeah. Okay. And I think that's why uh, the Latino voter message is more powerful too. Is it's so specifically like this is about you, and it's why this is also something I should have talked about but didn't. Um, is why radio advertisements don't work in general, but radio advertisements that are on Spanish language stations work. Uh, Don Green and Costas Panagopoulos did that in November 2006, and uh, found that Latino voters responded to local radio station advertisements in Spanish. 
Uh, because again, it's saying, well, they went through all this trouble to get on my radio station in my language and reach out to me. Right? So even though it's impersonal, it's kind of personal mm -hmm. because it's in Spanish and it's directed at me. Uh, and a few other people have tried this with mail as well, that uh, you know, if the mailing is in Spanish and English instead of just English, it's sending a message of, oh, this is really for me because it's translated. Right? You can't send it in only Spanish because then you'll just piss people off, like, hey, I speak English, what's wrong with you? But Spanish and English saying, this is really meant for you to be able to read has an effect. Yeah? Uh, uh, following up on that, I, I, you know, I, we, we know that Latino voters are not like black voters. That, uh, you, know, you put them in the voting booth and they want to always do the right thing. Uh, so, uh, hey, you know, let's say... 76% voted for Obama. That's well, let, let's say Marco Rubio calls you up and asks for your vote. Uh, that concerns the Latino message that, that, that you were just talking about. And, uh, well, I've done some research uh, with you know, cross Those work shows that, that that kind of thing, that kind of appeal, uh, uh, ethnic surname alone is a very powerful appeal because it suggests inclusiveness when maybe, you know, but not, like, in the face, like you and I would not in the face of partisan things. labels. Matt and I have an ongoing scholarly conversation about this and over, over beers conversation. If there is a, if there is a cross-pressured partisan label, that doesn't work. Um, so, if, so if the Latino surname is attached to a Republican Party label, it doesn't work. It's only in a nonpartisan election, like a LA City Council election or a Miami-Dade County City Council election, where all you see is the surname and you don't know what, what political party they are, that, that Latino voters will vote for the Republican or vote for the conservative. But if it says Democrat, Republican, and the white guy has the Democratic label and the Latino guy has the Republican label, Latino voters will prefer the, the Democrat. Well, but, uh, I, and, and I wonder what you mean by, by preference, because um, you know, some of the historical work I've done, and I know that doesn't fit anywhere in New York, suggests that they really don't want a majority of Latino voters, but if they can take a big chunk out of it, that would be enough to carry a lot of elections in the Southwest, or to neutralize the Latino Democratic vote. But right now, the Republican Party label is pretty toxic. So unless they do something to detoxify, de 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 detoxify, thank you, to detoxify the Republican Party label, they're not going to get, I mean, George W. got 40%, but since then it's been on a pretty steady decline. And I don't think the Republicans are winning any converts with Marco Rubio. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm like, he's ready to... No, I should really not start ranting about Marco Rubio. <laughs> yes? Yeah, so um, you mentioned in the beginning that um, from sort of the conventional political science voting theory perspective, it was a little bit against your odds or not in favor of your odds, and so you kind of proved that wrong. How was that received in the political science community, or what are sort of the larger theoretical implications for voting theory? It, it has not only been well received, but I think we saw that the political parties were listening because um, I think we saw in 2012 that they really went out to those communities. I mean, obviously it was relevant uh, to, to Obama running again, but uh, on the ground we see Republicans and Democrats reaching out to these communities with live phone banks and door-to-door -door canvassing just like we told them to. So I think it's been pretty well received, which is exciting. Um, even if some of them end up voting Republican, like at least they're voting, um, which is, you know, a start. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, the experimental literature in general has really been challenging a lot of long-held assumptions about the way politics works and the way pop people think. And there is now kind of a battle going on between the observational scholars who rely on massive surveys and the experimentalists who do these randomized field experiments. And, the, and there's an ongoing debate and stuff that's super fun. Um, but in terms of like real life, which is really what I care more about than if scholars all think I'm right, but politicians think that we're right. right? Politicians are now doing this. And since this get out the vote field experiments, subfield has gone nuts in the last 15 years. And we've seen campaigns on the ground Right, actual candidates and parties doing this stuff that we said worked, right, and adopting all the stuff we said worked. So it's 
it's pretty satisfying. I wanted, I've never answered your question about like the world thing. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm, I don't know the state of the literature, the degree to which the United States is compared to the rest of the world. Well, we're pretty sucky. No, I know what, I know we suck. I mean, right? the literature, how it's dealing <laughs> with that. Um, so most of the early get out the vote stuff was in the United States, but then it's been going to different countries. I actually just did one in Brazil. Turns out this works in Brazil too. Uh, and you can do different things in Brazil than you can do in the United States. Uh, and other people have done it in the Netherlands and in France. and in, So more and more people are doing it, but it's just like starting to bleed out into the rest of the world. So they're mostly doing door-to-door -door canvassing. Mm -hmm. And pretty much everywhere they're trying it, it works too. So it seems to be some sort of universal thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but we did a really cool thing in Brazil where we sent people 30-second uh, ads 30 second videos from candidates, so treatment and control, um, to people who were not covered by compulsory voting laws. Um, so meaning either they're 16 or 17 years old or over 70. And it turns out if you send young people a little video, they are way more likely to vote. Um, and then both young people, way. sorry. Send it on their. It goes out to their smartphone. It's an app called WhatsApp, uh, which is very popular. Seven year olds don't know how to turn it on. Well, that's just it. Like, either 70-year-olds don't have a smartphone or don't have WhatsApp because it's really a young person thing, or when they get it, they're just like, what's my phone doing? I, I don't know. I don't know how they're responding. Um, but for young people, it was enormously powerful. Um, and get out the vote door-to-door -door in Brazil. It's totally worked, right? Um, so an email didn't work. So, uh, there's lots of hands popping up. I know I only have a couple more seconds, so. Um, do you want to have the last question? Yeah, in the back. I'm sorry, I don't yeah, know your name. Yeah, you know, my concern is that uh, the groups that uh, they do campaign, what they lack if, is volunteers. And that is the reason why I'm asking you, what is the content of your, of your first encounter? What is the content of your canvassing? You know, and what should the content be? So I'm thinking that the, that the first meeting is very crucial, but if the, if the objective is really just to have the vote out, you know, uh, you don't leave more substance, you'll be doing it again and again, and the same people will be <coughs> someone, someone else. You know, so there's no... That's not what we've no got, other, though. That is the reason why I wanted to, uh, you know, and my question was the content of your office, not what has happened, maybe what has happened, positive, but it's for towards the future, you see? And um, because from, what I, from my work, what I'm lacking is, is lots of volunteers to do some work, to do the phone banks and to do in the campaigns that have passed. They don't have to be, can, they don't have to be volunteers, you can pay them. You just have to make sure that they act properly. They don't, if you can get people to do the work, you, well, you can regardless them. whether they do the work for you, is what are they going to say and what's the purpose of the canvassing? To get in your view as an expert. I am reached that I'm reaching out to you as a human being and I'm saying your vote is important. Right? What's your name? Beta. Beta. I'm saying, Beta, you I need you to vote. Beta, I need to can I count on you to vote? I really want you to participate. Can I Get your word that you'll vote. That's what I, that's what it has to be. It has to be a personal, like this is about you as a human being, you as an individual. I'm bringing you in and I'm inviting you in and I'm making you feel valued and invited as a human being, as an individual into the polity. That's what it's about. How do you convince me? Well, we might have to talk for 20 minutes. How do you convince me? My question is, how do you convince me uh, not only to vote, but be aware that I am a citizen and I can participate. Not, you know, how could your visit produce more people to be active and be responsible citizens that can also participate? This is, there's you a know, really good book you should read. <laughs> this is really, you should read this book. This is what we talk about with the sociocultural cognition model, that we are changing people's identities and conceptions of themselves by reaching out to them. Yeah, because you know, when you come to me and you tell me I want you to vote, it's important to vote, you're not telling me much. You right. see? But when I am talking to you and I am trying to make sure that not only I get your vote, but that's not the purpose for my visit, but it's to be able to tell you other things that persuade you in a way that you will be working with me alone 
or with someone else's. So you become more conscious uh, citizen. So I will, be knock, knock, I will not be knocking at your door for you to make a vote because that's already for granted. It's my purpose, one of the main purposes is to make sure to make, make more active people. Maybe, See? can I interrupt just briefly? Go ahead. Maybe what you're getting at in some sense has to do with this question of credibility and trust with the organization that's doing it. If they're already present in the community and doing other work, other than electoral work, they're community organizations, that there's not only an opportunity to gain their trust because, oh yeah, I know of you, but there are other ways in which I can get involved other than just voting. And we do think it's important that this was all nonpartisan, so we're not saying, I want you to vote so that my party will win or so that I will win or so that this measure will win. I don't care who you vote for, oh, okay. right? So part of what they're saying is I value your participation and I'm not here just instrumentally to win this campaign. I'm here because you're a valuable part of the polity. But there's no conversation with these groups that have greater credibility about the other work they're doing in the community? They don't, like, I think it matters. along the lines of what Berta is trying to do. But some of the other work that I've done shows that part of the problem is that if you start talking about all this stuff, like, you should vote. And also, by the way, we have citizenship classes and we have these other things going on. We have a legal defense team if you need legal protection. And then people forget that, oh, right, I was supposed to vote. And so it actually weakens the effect of the get out the vote message if you start talking about all the stuff that your group does. Mm -hmm. Or if you're surveying them about what do they care about and what are their issue concerns. And, and then it, they, when they are recalling the conversation, oh, that nice young person came to my door and talked to me about their group, you forget that it was a get out the vote visit. Listen, yeah, go ahead. One little thing. There are a few places in California now which are experimenting in participatory budgeting like Vallejo especially, but there's also in the Central Valley, there's a couple of places, which is a different way for, and, and in participatory budgeting, undocumented residents participate just a lot. There's no citizenship requirement. Right. And one of the arguments for participatory budgeting is that it is a big, powerful identity changer because you're directly involved in allocating city resources for projects, um, and that therefore creates a different context but then get out the vote for other efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, the only one that I've been directly involved with is in the Vallejo participatory budgeting. Uh, but I don't know if, they've, if there's any research effort on the voting spillover effects there, which would be really, really interesting to do your kind of experiment in a place like Vallejo that's now had three years of participatory budgeting. With pretty high, they get higher turnouts for the participatory budgeting votes than for local elections. Were people assigned randomly to be invited no, to participate? They, no, anybody can participate. They haven't done ex mm -hmm. they haven't done any experiments on it. But in terms of getting people to participate in the participatory budgeting, everybody in the city was invited. Yeah. Oh, so, but no, more than in a city, you want it more exclusive. No, that, well, it should be random. Think, Randomize everything. I think for the participatory budgeting, what would be interesting would be to do a get out the vote randomized experiment in a place that has a participatory budgeting mm -hmm. to see if you know if these baselines and these effects are different in a context where there's this other mobilizing effort to get participation going. In other words, they're more politicized people. They're more participatized, you know, they're not necessarily more politicized mm -hmm. in the sense of partisan political. Right. Or, Small but they're politics. oriented towards there's yeah. this constant Without a randomization at the beginning, it might be hard to prove it. It would be more speculative, but it would be interesting, right? Unless there's some cutoff of people somehow. So are you one of the authors of this book? Yes. Second. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Sorry. You, That's why, you that was too was subtle. It's a plug. Uh, uh, that, was, that was a blatant plug. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that was this is the book. It describes uh, the California Votes Initiative. Oh, okay. To uh, what extent are you using the new contemporary science discoveries for helping you to campaign better? For example, the entanglement theory will be a very effective tool to be able to train people who could, who could actually go door to door. You see, and then uh, that is the reason I was saying we're yeah. behind, very behind. I don't know. We need to know get new knowledge and try to be able to reach and not only have experts here, but also be able to bring 
uh, there are conventions that different parties, especially the Democrat parties have, and the candidates talk about issues, you see, and when you are canvassers, you have no idea, they are not informed, you know, that has an effect there too. But if they are going to be either hire or be volunteer and try to have the proper material for them to be trained properly, then, then they are not only going to get for the vote, but they are going to go further. I, I, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying, but I mean, I think it's... I don't know if I understand what you're saying either, but maybe you could talk later and help me figure it out. I just, because we're over time, I just want to remind people, not just, not just that we're over time, but that there's a second talk tomorrow. On the, and I'll be in my office tomorrow. On the dreamers, right? Do you want to tell us the title of tomorrow's talk? Uh, haha. Okay. It's, the, the title of the book that's the basis for the talk tomorrow is called Living the Dream, um, New Immigration Policies and the Lives of Undocumented Latino Youth. And it just came out, and it's a very different thing. There's no experiments in it at all. There's just interviews, and it's awesome, and you should come yeah. hear me talk about that book. So I do experiments, Another and awesome I do interviews. It's an, you know, it's another fabulous book, you know, available in a bookstore near you. Uh, so that's tomorrow at that's 4 o'clock, but across the street in 8417 at the Social Science Building. Come in on the sixth floor, go back up two floors. Come on over. And then Usually on Thursday, at Menlo, nobody comes to my office hours, so this will be really nice to, pe to have people actually come talk to me. And then on Thursday at 1220, also in 8108, Social Science is uh, just an open forum discussion. <clears throat> about any of these issues. You can talk her ear off. Awesome. Yeah, come give me some more ideas. Because I don't know entanglement theory, I don't even know what that is. But okay. it sounds like you know a lot of stuff that I should know. So we should talk some more. Teaching people. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you everyone for coming.